right, so we're back in the kitchen to talk about continuations, which is one of the last topics in the course. Continuations generalize all notions of control flow to be able to abstract and allow you to build patterns like loops and exceptions in an intricate way that manipulate the stack as a first class object. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Now, often when we talk about evaluating a program, we think about evaluating it in a set of steps. And we usually apply something like, for example, a reduction relation. If you remember if or if, the sort of standard formulation was that we had some term, we identified the proper redex or reducible expression, we dove down into the term, we performed the reduction, and then we came back out and reassembled the term. So for example, we might have this expression uh, plus two times one, three, and we would reduce two times one to two, and then we would reduce the entire expression uh, 2 plus 3 to 5. And remember, in textual reduction, what we did was we had some expression, maybe an arbitrarily complicated expression, and we tore that expression apart to find the appropriate reducible expression or redex within that expression. We then performed the proper reduction, maybe, for example, beta reduction, or a substitution that we performed in Itherith, for example. And then we reconstructed the term. So at every point in the computation, we're identifying a redux, we're performing a reduction, and then we're reconstructing the term to end up with a reduced term, where we've changed just one redux. All right? Now, in a real implementation, this would be a pretty slow thing to do, because we'd always be diving through the term, identifying the redux, doing the little small bit of local work, and then diving all the way back out. So in practice, most programming languages don't do this. It's just too slow. It's really nice for specifying things formally, mathematically, but it's just not a very efficient way to actually implement an interpreter. And it's not the way that any real programming language would actually work. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to think about something that's in what we're going to call explicit stack. So I'm going to use this little Russian nesting doll in a slightly different style this time. This is representing an empty stack where I've got a hole where I can stick a computation. All right, and then when I'm done with that computation, the since this is the empty stack, I just return. All right, so the empty stack just says when you're finished with the current computation of uh, two times one plus three, you stick that result in this uh, in this hole here, and you'll have completed the computation. All right, so that's the first uh, that's the first stack frame we're going to say. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, push a frame onto the stack that's going to be remembering that. Um, what we're going to do is put the value that we get as the return value from 2 times 1 and add that to 3. So we have this little stack here that says sort of we've got a, uh, we've got a plus of the, the empty stack at the top, and then we've got uh, plus box 3. So that kind of represents this reduction context where we're in where we've got uh, 2 times 1. We have this hole here telling us we need to add 3 to the result, and then we have the empty stack on top of that basically. Right, And so we can kind of keep going and we can reduce this uh, 2 times 1 to 2, at which point we'll be ready to return back to this stack right here. We'll have sealed that up, throw that one away, and then we'll start evaluating 3, which is going to tell us that after we evaluate 3, we need to then go back and add 2 to the result of that. So we're sort of walking through the program one expression at a time, building the stack as we go. All right. And then we finally get to the final reduction where we have 2 plus 3, then the empty stack waiting for our answer. We evaluate our result to 5, then it's just the empty stack. We wrap it all up, and we're done with our computation. All right? All right, so these stacks have another appeal as well. Along with being something where we can get an explicit representation of the control flow structure when we think about programs like this, they're also very fast to implement. So. If we'd actually just tried to implement the redex semantics where we drill, drilled down into the hole and tried to figure out what the right redex was and then constructed back up, that would require us taking a linear pass through the term each time. But when we use a stack, we're only ever making a small local change to the program, which kind of mirrors one of the bigger concepts in computer science when we think about control flow. We usually want to think about ourselves as applying one small atomic step at once, making some local change, and then stepping out to the stack to tell us what us to do next. Now, at least in this course, we're not really going to talk too much about the efficiencies of the style. We're going to focus more on the kind of expressivity gains it gives us. Although it is a, a thing that you would clearly want to do for efficiency-related reasons, if you're really interested in understanding why we would actually want to represent stacks like this and how we would represent them under the hood using the computer's heap and the C stack, then you'll have to take the compiler's course, which is CIS 400, next year. All right, now one thing that I'd really like to press you to do is to think about, as you walk through the computation, 
what the control return point would look like if you were to think about the rest of the computation, which I'm going to call the continuation, as a function. All right, so what do I mean by that? Well, think about this expression here. When we first see this expression, the very first time, when we see plus of two times one plus three, all right? Well, it, when we start to process that expression, we're going to start with the empty stack, which we can represent by this function lambda x, x, where this x right here is going to be the return value of whatever this whole computation is right here. All right, so this is kind of the empty stack because it represents the fact that whenever we're done processing this entire expression, we just wanna hand it back to you. The empty stack says you're sort of done with the computation, you don't need to do anything else, and that's what lambda xx kind of represents. All right, so then when we go to down and dive and process this two times one, we need to remember that after we're going to finish doing the two times one, we need to take its result, x, and then continue the computation by doing x plus three. All right, and then when we dive into two, we need to remember, all right, we'll apply that to x plus three. Then we switch over to evaluating three over here. We've computed two times one, we've evaluated it to two. And so we need to remember that when we're done evaluating two plus three, or sorry, when we're done evaluating this three right here, we need to return to plug that in to this lambda right here and then do two plus x. All right, so you can do this for any program. At any point in the program, if I ask you, so I say sort of you're right here, I might say, what does the rest of the computation look like? Well, you would say, oh, well, it's lambda x, x plus three. And you can always think about any program like this that accepts a single argument function, which is kind of the hole that you're gonna drop this computation into, and then sort of reconstructs the rest of the program after you've kind of processed it. Now, if you're the kind of person who's actually used to programming in an object-oriented language like Java or JavaScript, you can think about this continuation function as a callback that sort of says, when you're done returning this local result, whenever you're done processing, for example, two times one, you're going to take that result that you finally evaluate to, and you're going to stuff it into this callback that will continue the function. That's why we call it the continuation. It's a callback function that you're going to call with the result of whatever computation you're currently doing. And that continuation, which accepts that single one argument result, is then going to take this return value right here and then help continue the computation. All right, so there's a special form named call CC. And this form call CC is going to accept a single argument lambda as its parameter. This single argument lambda is going to have this structure lambda k and then some body. What's gonna happen is that when control reaches this call cc right here, it's going to bind the current continuation or this function that represents the rest of the computation to k, all right? Well, we're gonna see some examples of this in a few seconds, but it's a pretty hard thing to get your mind around. It's actually wrapping up the rest of the computation as a function that you can then invoke. So let's look at this. So for example, right here, when we hit this call CC form, where we get this call CC and then we've got this lambda K, when we bind K right here, this is going to be a function that is lambda X plus for an X. The reason is because if we take the, where this call CC is in the program and we think about, now if this is the return point, what would the continuation look like? Well, it's gonna be filling in this hole right here for this call CC dropping the return value x right there, and then adding four to that result right here. So call cc is actually going to allow us to bind this return point right here as a call site that we can then actually get our hands on and re-invoke. All right, so let's look at some examples of this. Uh, say I've got, for example, an expression like um, one plus two plus two times three. I can imagine how the computer is gonna step through this expression. First, it's gonna evaluate one plus two, and while it's gonna evaluate one plus two, it's remembering that it has to go back and do lambda x of two, uh, two times three plus x. So I need to do plus x two times three. And this function right here is the thing that we're going to call the continuation, all right? So the continuation is just a callback function that's going to represent the rest of the computation while you're at some point. So while I'm at this highlighted point right here and I'm processing this 
one, uh, one plus two, I'm going to remember that the continuation or how I'm going to carry on is that I need to have lambda x and then plus x two times three. And that's because I have this hole right here that I'm going to plug this return value, which is going to eventually be three into and stuff it into this x right here to then continue on the computation. All right, when I finish that, I would end up with something. And then after I process the one plus two, I'm going to end up in this continuation where I'm processing um, two times three. And then my continuation is going to look like lambda x. And now I've already evaluated the first one plus two to three. And so I do plus three x. And this is because I always evaluate uh, left hand sides before right hand sides in racket. All right. So now let's look at an example using call CC. So let's do plus of plus, um, let's say plus two, three, and then call CC. And then I'm gonna have lambda continuation K here. And then I'm gonna invoke K on four. All right, so what's going to happen when I reach this point right here? What will this continuation K get bound to? All right, well, we're gonna have two plus three right here, which will have been evaluated to five. And then we'll get back a lambda X and then a plus five and then whatever the X is because we're gonna plug this hole which reached this call CC with whatever this value is. So the return point that we capture with the call CC, K will get bound to this continuation right here. And then when we actually apply k to four, we're gonna take this value four right here, plug this hole plus five, four, and we'll get back nine. All right, so the result of this entire expression right here, if we just run it in the REPL, is gonna be nine. All right, so the next example I'm gonna show is going to use begin. So if I look at this begin form right here, it's gonna do two things. First, begin accepts a sequences of expressions and it's going to run them one after another. So first it's gonna run display ln, hello there. And next it's going to return this function error, bad error. Now this is a special form that's going to throw an error to the top level. So when I run this expression, I'm going to see hello there printed, but then I'm going to get this erroneous output bad error. All right, so I can see I get bad error coming from here. All right, now let's look at a variant of this expression. So let's look at plus uh, three and then call CC and then lambda K. And now let's just not think about what's gonna be in the body yet. We're gonna fill in the body, but what will, be, uh, what will K be bound to? Well, K is going to be bound to, when it reaches this point, the continuation is we're gonna drop in that value right here. So it's gonna be plus three of X. So it's gonna be lambda X plus three of X. All right, now it doesn't matter what I put in here. Whenever I'm in this body right here, if I invoke K, another thing that's special is that I'm immediately gonna stop what I'm doing. I'm immediately gonna ignore the current stack. I'm gonna throw it out. And I'm actually going to reset the stack to be what this continuation K is. And that's something that's very special about continuation invocation. That's unlike regular function invocation. When you invoke a continuation, it's going to reset the stack to be whatever that continuation is. So let's look at this example right here. I'm gonna call K on uh, three and then, or let's just do a begin. I'm gonna call K on three and then I'm gonna do error and then bad error. Now what's gonna happen when I run this code is that I'm gonna get plus three and then I'm gonna bind call CC, I'm gonna bind K to this continuation. So K equals this continuation. And it's going to begin and it's going to walk through these one after another. So it's going to invoke K3 and then boom. Because I hit a continuation, anything that I was gonna do after this statement in the current continuation right now, the current stack, which again is going to tell me that normally if this were just a regular function call, like something like, for example, the identity function. So if this were something like lambda x, x, then this would just return three and it would go to bad error. But when I invoke K right here, what's gonna happen is that I'm going to abort the current continuation and I'm going to reinstate the continuation to be whatever this continuation K is right here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna abandon my current stack. I'm not gonna go back to this error. I'm gonna skip past it and I'm gonna invoke this continuation plugging it in for three. So I'm gonna get three plus three 
And if I execute this piece of code in the REPL, I'm going to see the answer is six. Now, I want to highlight a specific kind of danger. And this is something I've said a few seconds ago, but I really want to hit pretty hard, which is that whenever you apply or invoke a continuation, it's different than invoking a function. When you invoke a function, return from that function comes back to the point where you called the function. But when you invoke a continuation, all continuation and invocations are tail calls in the sense that they throw away the current stack and replace the current stack with whatever the continuation was and then stuff the argument into the result of that continuation. So just to say this again, invoking a continuation is different than invoking a function. This is one thing that is very easy to screw up if you don't think about it a little bit carefully. When you, you, when you see function applications, you're used to them just returning back to that point and doing the natural return structure. But under the circumstance that you invoke a continuation, unlike regular function calls, you abandon the current stack and you reinstate the stack from that continuation with whatever argument you're then passing into the continuation. So when control flow executes and hits this point right here of the call CC, K is going to get bound as the continuation for plus four and then X, all right? And then when we invoke this continuation K right here, we abandon the current continuation and we reinstate the saved continuation. But here's the crucial thing. For this example, it's kind of a degenerate case because the saved continuation is equivalent to the current continuation. And so we don't really observe any difference. All right, now let's look at this next example right here. So I've got plus one, and then I've got call CC, and then I bind the control point right here as K, and then I have two statements. And lambdas implicitly form begins, by the way. So if you have a sequence of statements in a lambdas body, it's actually treated as if a begin. So it's you walk through them one by one. So this is saying first execute K of three, and then after that call print zero. But here's the crucial thing. Because we're invoking a continuation right here, we invoke K of three, we actually never reach this print zero right here, all right? So this is a little bit different. This is what's called a, a preemptive return. And you can sort of see how you might generalize this notion to being able to construct, for example, exceptions. And that's what we're gonna do in the next lecture, all right? So pause the video right here, type this one into Dr. Racket, and make sure you can really understand why the print zero is never actually going to be reached in this code. I've got call CC of lambda K0. So we're gonna bind K0 to be the continuation at this point right here. And this is just the identity function because this is sort of the top of the stack. When you're done returning from this call CC, you don't have to do anything else to actually continue the computation. So K0 is going to equal continuation lambda XX, all right? And so then we have uh, plus one, and now we have another call CC. So this call CC is going to be uh, taking whatever we stuff in this hole and then continue the computation to do plus one and that. So this uh, K1, K1 is gonna be another continuation where we're gonna have lambda X and then plus one X, all right? And now uh, we're going to evaluate plus one and then boom, K0. So when we invoke K0, the moment we invoke K0, even though we were going to go back and continue adding plus one and continue adding this plus one, we're going to drop all of that on the ground and reset our stack to actually just be this continuation right here, which means that the result from the entire expression is just going to be lambda x, x, the identity function applied to three, which is then just going to give us back three. So if I take this entire expression right here and I run this one in the REPL, I just get back the return value three. All right, so let's look at the next one. So if I do call CC of lambda K zero, again, I'm binding K zero just as uh, this empty continuation, oops. All right, just as the top level continuation. And then I'm binding K one in the same way as the last one. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call plus one of K zero and K one of three. But when I get to this point, K one, 
which I have to do before I actually evaluate K0. So before I actually apply K0, I have to evaluate its argument. In evaluating its argument, I'm going to perform the application of K1 to 3. And immediately when I apply this K1 right here, I'm going to jump out and substitute and actually apply this computation. So even though I was gonna do plus one of plus one, I'm actually gonna jump out back to this return point and fill in this entire hole right here for this entire sub-expression as three. So this is going to be plus one, three, or four, all right? So this one is plus one, three, or evaluates to four. All right, put that one in. We can see that one evaluates to four. And now, let the, how about this very last one right here? So I'll take this one and copy it over. All right, so here's the next one we've got. Um, so we've got this first call CC is going to be uh, K0. It's gonna be the same thing as the last one. And um, the next one right here is going to say K1 K1 is going to be this continuation at this point in the program, which we're going to fill this hole right here and then continue on to evaluate K0 of one. So that's going to be this thing that's going to be plus one, uh, plus one X. So lambda X plus one X and then K0 one. So that's how we're gonna continue the computation because remember, when we evaluate things in Racket, we're going to evaluate left to right. So we're gonna evaluate one first, that evaluates to itself immediately. Then we're gonna evaluate this call CC and then we're gonna evaluate K0. So as we're evaluating this call CC right here, we'll bind K1 to be this continuation where we substitute into the middle thing. And then we'll do plus one of K13, which then fills this hole right here, drops it all on the ground and then just fills this in with three and then calls K0 on one. And so because we're performing the evaluation of this argument K0 one for the plus right here, even though we were going to go back and continue to add one and three to whatever this result is, because this K0 again is a continuation, we're again going to drop what we were going to do right here on the ground and we're just going to return one. So this whole thing just returns one. All right, so just to step back and summarize this lecture a little bit, uh, continuations are going to allow us to actually get a hold of the stack in a first class way. They appear like functions in Racket, except they have this special property. Whenever we invoke a continuation, it resets the stack from whatever the stack currently was, the current continuation, to whatever the snack was at the time that we captured the continuation. We're gonna reinstate the continuation or the snapshot of the stack from that point in time. This call CC function, or its longer, uh, less abbreviated form, call with current continuation, accepts a single argument lambda that binds a continuation we typically call K. And then we can use within the call CC's body that K to then perform and execute that continuation to jump back up to that frame and go back out. And we're going to see as we go throughout a few more of the lectures this week how this actually enables us to get extremely general control over control flow in the program and build out things like coroutines, preemptive returns, exceptions, and other advanced kinds of control constructs of that nature. Basically any kind of looping or sort of weird control construct you can imagine can typically be written using continuations. So stick around for that. I do think this is a pretty genuinely confusing topic, so you might have to go through the examples a few times, and please do come to class prepared to ask some questions about it, all right? All right, well, thanks so much.